Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Behind the Story podcast. I'm Clodagh Higginson and today we will be discussing how our economy can recover from the damage inflicted by the coronavirus pandemic and what pain we may have to endure along the way. For this, thankfully I'm joined by three very distinguished guests. Lord Norman Lamont was Chancellor of the Exchequer under John Major from 1990 to 1993. He also held a number of ministerial posts in Margaret Thatcher's cabinet and has been a member of the House of Lords since 1998. Sir so Vince Cable was leader of the Liberal Democrats from 2017 to last year. He also served in the coalition government's cabinet as Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills for five years to 2015. So Vince stepped down as an MP last year. He continues to write regularly on the economy for The Independent and Bloomberg. We're also joined by Lord Stuart Wood. From 2007 to 2010, Lord Wood was a senior special advisor to the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown on issues ranging from foreign policy to culture, media and sport. Lord Wood was also a member of the Labour Shadow Cabinet and an advisor to former Labour leader Ed Miliband from 2010 to 2015. Welcome to you all. Hello. So let's kick off uh, with the topic that is obviously wall-to-wall -wall coverage at the moment, the coronavirus pandemic has caused a global shutdown. In the space of a few months, markets have gone into free fall. And in the UK alone, thousands of companies are at risk of going bust, putting millions of people at risk of losing their jobs. In these unprecedented times, people are wondering what is likely to lie ahead. So I would like to ask you three experts on the economy, what sort of pain we may have to endure. I'd like to put my first question to Lord Lamont. Do you think we are looking at a recession worse than that which we experienced in 2008? And if so, what will that look like? Well, I think we are looking at a worse recession than 2008. Can I just quibble with the word recession? I mean, this is not a recession that is caused by the economy overheating or by market forces or by a rise in interest rates. This is a shutdown of the economy. And it is the measures the government have taken to safeguard the health of the nation that causes the economic uh, problem. Uh, so it's really putting the economy into deep freeze. And I don't think the economy is going necessarily just to uh, recover naturally. I think things would have changed when we eventually emerged. When people say, will we have a V-shaped, a U-shaped or an L-shaped recovery? I think it will be a pretty gradual recovery. Some sectors will bounce back but not necessarily to exactly where they were before. But there are some sectors that are going to disappear. I mean, if you think of part of the services sector, hospitality, tourism, restaurants, hotels, I think they are going to, and airline travel, they're going to be very badly hit for a long time. And even when we're out of this situation, and we have to maintain social distancing in some form, social distancing is not really compatible with the profitability of those sectors. So I think this is a very serious situation indeed. I think the government has responded uh, economically uh, pretty well and has flung a lot of money at it. But I think part of the consequence of the furloughing scheme, for example, is to lull people into a false sense of security. I don't think they really see what is round the corner. And I think what is round the corner is pretty horrible. Do you think the fur, you know, it cannot be sustained for how long do you think that's well, the, furlough, of the, furlough, health? the furlough scheme is very expensive and I don't think it can go on very, very, very long. And you know, some people sitting at home may not realise that uh, you know, they're not very well paid, they're getting 2,500 a month, they're not spending much money. They may feel relatively secure and not realise that their jobs have disappeared or are about to disappear or that their firm is in serious trouble. I mean, when you get things like British Airways uh, getting rid of 12,000 people, Shell cutting its dividend for the first time in 77 years, these are just little indicators of what is to come. Uh, Lord Wood, you're nodding um, there. Do you agree with that gradual um, change or is there a different shape you would see on the recovery? No, I agree with every word that Norman said there. I thought that was very wise. I, I mean, I do, I guess I think of the recovery as sort of like a Nike tick shape, uh, a deep, a deep plunge, and then a very gradual sort of stuttering uptick over a long period of time. I mean, it is, it is, I mean, I was involved with Gordon Brown in, in responding to the 2008 crash. This is a much, much more complicated 
crash, uh, shock. As Norman said, it's, it's not really a, a recession or even depression. It's a sort of temporary ice age. But, but, the, but the question is, how long will it last? What will be the shape? Will there be setbacks in the recovery? There are so many what Donald Rumsfeld once called unknown unknowns about the character of the disease, the character of the economic response. It's incredibly difficult. And it's not just an economic crisis, it's a crisis in transport, health, education, internationally. It's every kind of crisis rolled into one. But it's a supply and demand shock at once, which makes it very, very difficult. Uh, markets can't really price properly because no one knows how long it's going to last and when something like normality will return. I do worry that actually markets are being slightly naive. There seems to be a sort of three months and then we'll get back to normal orthodoxy underneath every everything. And I, f I fear that may be dis disappointed eventually. And then it's not a symmetrical shock. It's not, it's not like the recovery is just going to be the gradual return of everything that was put into the deep freeze for a few weeks or a few months. As Norman said, there'll be some companies and some sectors that really won't have any chance of recovering. There are some companies and sectors which were very near the edge anyway, and this has basically brought, brought them to an end prematurely. And also, I think it's going to be very difficult to unwind the scope of the state that has come into economic and social life. I mean, in, in the US, for example, I was reading that um, in over half of the states of the United States now, the average worker is getting more in unemployment benefit than they were getting in their previous salaries. It's very difficult to go back once you've given people an experience of that level of support. And as Norman says, actually, that level of support is, is not sustainable in the long term. But the expectations and the politics around it are very difficult to unwind. Similarly, for state intervention in transport, sector and, and, and state intervention in small businesses. So there's not a symmetry really about the recovery compared to the, to the, to the, to the shock. And I think that is an ongoing problem for governments for the next few months and years. So do you think the government's overpromised? You know, I, it, much, I don't think there was really much alternative in many ways. There are alternative ways that one could have responded in terms of the 80% guarantee. I mean, I think Rishi Sunak has really been excellent in his response. I think Rishi Singh has also been excellent in that he initially said, look, we may not get this right, bear with us. We reserve the right to, to, to adjust in response to the design problems of things that are being invented on the hoof. That was a level of honesty in Canada that I think was really, really well appreciated and, and, and exactly right. But, you know, we're entering a world, I'm going to give you one example of something which is totally transformed now. It, we, we lived in a world for 10 years when, when Vince Cable was in government, when Gordon Brown was in government, where you had inflation targets, you had independent central banks, you had a fiscal rules framework. All three of those are now exploded. All three of those are exploded. Um, we're not in a world where central banks are really independent. They're working hand in glove with governments. We want them to work hand in glove with governments. The idea of fiscal rules and 3% targets for deficits, I mean, that's, that's a historical phenomenon already. Uh, inflation targeting, I mean, who knows how much inflation there is out there when the recovery begins? It's a really interesting question. Uh, so we're just in a totally different world in macroeconomic policy and to the world we were in even a few weeks ago. And I think adjusting to that new reality is not just a matter of getting back to the old ways. It's going to be restoring confidence in a totally alien and different economic environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Vince, uh, so Vince, you've been um, very vocal recently about how you think that um, young people are suffering in this pandemic uh, in order to support older people, which is um, a controversial viewpoint. When would you like to see lockdown lifted and why? Well, can I just go back a little bit to the analysis we just had and then I'll directly answer your question. Sure. I mean, I agree with the analysis. Um, I think there's one important thing that's been missed is that unlike uh, 2008, 2009, this is global. You know, then China and India kept going, growing rapidly, the world economy kept moving, but this time it affects everybody. Uh, the IMF are talking about a decline in the world economy of about five, six percent from peak to trough, uh, which we've not experienced since the Second World War, and that's on very fragmentary data, obviously. Um, for countries like the UK, US, probably nine to ten percent. Again, that may be optimistic, um, but to put it in context, uh, the US declined from peak to trough about 30% in the Great Depression, Greece in the recent Eurozone crisis. So, you know, the current estimates based on very, very fragmentary data um, is that we're somewhere between the 
severity of the Great Depression and the financial crisis. And the manifestations of it we're beginning to see, massive unemployment, um, the collapse of many companies for no fault of their own, many of them extremely well run, they just lack liquidity, uh, or their short-term profitability performance hasn't been good. But you know, I, I agree with all the analysis we've had. In terms of the, the, the question you asked me, I mean, what I have been arguing is, is that, of course, it's terribly important that we listen to scientific advice and the advice of epidemiologists. Absolutely right, and the government's been absolutely correct about that. Uh, but when we're talking about expert advice, we also need to think about the economic dimension. As far as I can see, that's not been incorporated. Um, I did a little exercise um, a couple of weeks ago looking at a sort of the cost-benefit approach that the government would normally adopt in the case of public health. You know this organization called NICE. They do calculations, um, you know, when they're testing out a new drug of, like, you know, years saved of, of life. Um, this is not employed here. If we did have a cost-benefit approach, uh, w the lockdown is far in excess of what's justified in economic terms. Now, obviously, there are big ethical and humanitarian considerations out there that we've got away, but I'm, I'm very much with those people in the government and in parliament who are getting impatient uh, and feel that we're applying too high a weight to the risk of um, some degree of resurgence. We're bound to get that anyway. As soon as the lockdown is lifted a little, you're going to get an upturn in infections. But I think what we do need to have is a more structured, cost benefit approach to this. The risks are going to have to be taken. And as you said, it is the younger generation workers who are suffering and people like me who are, and Norman who are being uh, protected. <laughs> so, <laughs> rightly so. But when do you? When would you like to see lockdown lifted, um, Sir Vince? Do you think there is an actual time frame? You know, for our listeners, it's the kind of one question we were chatting before the, before the um, record with um, Lord Lamont, who says you know he's not listening to a lot of uh, a lot of the news because really the one question on all of our minds now is that you know as long as our, our loved ones are safe, when will life begin to? get back to normal. No, it, it's got to be based on expert advice, it's not, not people like me just throwing out <laughs> ideas. Um, and it's got to be done systematically. I think it's going to happen in stages, sector by sector. Just to take one simple example, um, I make good use of my local Virgin Active when it's open. Uh, but as an over 70, I will be, um, have to be particularly careful. But the industry is working through a protocol with the government in terms of all its different users, you know, when is a swimming pool safe, when is a mm -hmm. steam room safe, when is the equipment safe, and that kind of exercise is going to have to be gone through with shops, with restaurants, with factories, uh, and it'll happen sector by sector, but my, my emphasis would be on trying to open as quickly as possible. And just um, staying with you, uh, Sir Vince, for a sec, um, Lord Wood has said that he thinks that the Chancellor's response so far has been uh, excellent. How do you rate it? And if you were in his shoes, is there anything you would have done differently? And I'd like to ask Lord Lamont that next. Yes, I, I think it has been, you know, we've been fairly uh, near the top of the class on the economic response, near the bottom of the class in terms of the, the overall strategy. But um, I think there are two great questions. One of the indiv is individual help. And this is all now being channeled through universal credit. Um, and the benefit system. And in principle, that's right. We can't just throw money at everybody. But I think given the extremity of the situation, there is an argument for a one-off payment without all the conditionality attached to benefits. This gets what, what the Americans have done, what the Japanese have done, and there is certainly an argument for it. And I think um, in relation to business support, I mean, the difficulty is, and you know, there's no easy answer to this, is what kind of conditions you attach to uh, concessional loans to very big companies and the, the issue about their tax status, um, their overall conduct, their relationship with their workers and so on. And the more t conditions you attach, the, the slower the system gets. On the other hand, the more indiscriminate the payouts, uh, the more of a backlash there will be when we see that, that you know, millions have gone to Philip Green and perfectly good 
uh, small companies are not getting a penny. So I think okay. there are separate sets of consideration for those two categories. Okay, thank you. Well, Lord Lamont, you have been in the Chancellor's shoes um, and talking about bailing out these sorts of companies. How do you feel about the idea that we ought to be giving a £500 million loan to the likes of um, Virgin Airways uh, when Richard Branson is, is a tax exile? Well, I think we will end up having to do some surprising things. Uh, and I think it'll be very difficult to prevent it becoming political. I mean, you can see a number of airlines are in difficulty all over the world. Lufthansa are practically on the threat of bankruptcy. You've got British Airways struggling, you've got Virgin as well. Is the government going to choose between different airlines? That is going to be difficult. I mean, at the moment, the government is saying we don't want to give a loan. I wouldn't be surprised if circumstances didn't drive the government. I mean, this may seem an extraordinary thing to say, but I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't find the government taking equity stakes in companies before this is finally over. I don't, I mean, that for me would be the supreme irony, having been part of a government that privatized British Airways. The Conservatives then were taking a public stake in it. But I think things like that uh, might, might uh, happen. Can I just go back to what Vince was saying sure. about it isn't just for the epidemiologists, it isn't just for the scientists. I totally agree with that. But I think the government have been, I mean, he talks about the term cost-benefit analysis. I think the government have been weighing very carefully the economic arguments as well. And, you know, want, it will be a political judgment in the end between the scientists and the economists or what the business community are saying. But it is a form of protection for the government from the very beginning to say we're following the scientific advice. The problem has been the scientific advice is not always unanimous. Uh, and of course, it's always the role of politicians to decide between experts and experts are never unanimous. But Vince is right. This is a political decision. I mean, I've been on the side of wanting to ease up. I've grown rather impatient of it. But when I contemplate that you know, we might have a big spike I think if I was faced with a very gloomy forecast on health and was looking at the economy as well, I might well say another three weeks, another five weeks, we can just about do that in order not to have such a loss of, of life. Okay. So, you know, I'm reluctant to criticise the government on that ground. You know, I don't have, Vince doesn't have, or Wood doesn't have, we don't have access to the information on the health side. We don't know how grim it really looks. Indeed. Well, on, on the economic side, Lord Wood, Lord Wood, if I could come back to you, if the Treasury does take emergency stakes in companies, those threatened uh, with collapse, what on earth should the government do with these stakes? Well, that's a good question. I mean, that was, that's obviously what Gordon Brown did in 2008 with, uh, with two, at least two or more leading banks and, uh, and, and the disposal of those shares uh, has proven to be a long running problem for governments of all yes. types. Uh, I mean, I, th I think, look, I, th I think Norman's right that the principle should be that large companies, if they expect government help, that, that, that on behalf of the taxpayer, the taxpayer wants, wants some benefit from that and should, should get shares and, and sh shares which, have, which are not just sort of deadweight shares. I think that's yeah. a decent principle. Uh, now, at some point, there's going to be such a, it depends how widespread that principle is applied. You know, is that going to be applied to small businesses as well? I mean, it's very difficult to see how it would be applied all the way through the economy. But at some point, you're going to have to have some kind of devoted part of government to when the recovery begins, to thinking about how to dispose of these shares or maybe how to use them for sovereign wealth fund equivalent purposes. You could, I mean, there's all sorts of ways you could think about using uh, these sort of state chunks that, were, that are owned in a vast array of companies or in leading companies. Um, so I, I think that that's going to be a new kind of problem for, a, I mean, not, not a sort of problem that you'd expect a Boris Johnson government really to have, but I mean, it could become a strategic asset if, if we think collaboratively and long term about that. I, th I think just go back to another point related to this. I think Vince has put his finger on something really important about the transition we're about to go into. Who knows when exactly, but... Um, I, the most difficult days for the government are ahead of it, it seems to me, because the decision about how to unwind in what sequence um, and with what principles and uh, all, all of that, it, it, it's so important. And it requires, some, someone once referred to Bill Clinton as the great explainer in chief. 
when he was president. And you, you really need leaders to be explainers in chief because these are very complicated issues. And complicated issues about explaining to 17 year olds why them going out is, is dangerous for 85 year olds that they'll never meet. It's a very difficult series of issues, medically and public health terms. But the most difficult thing is about to happen, which is we're about to move from a situation, lockdown is, is, is extraordinarily brutal and freezes the economy but it has a clarity to it. It massively minimizes the risk of disease and death at the expense of all sorts of other things, educationally, economically, and et cetera. We're about to move to a situation in which there will be risks in resuming even limited normal life. Uh, and the calculation of those risks brings so many political problems. And we're gonna have to, the government's gonna have to explain to people that this is not that, that we are essentially dipping our toes in the water here and the risks are not borne equally uh, and there are health risks but there are also economic risks and government's going to be making calculations across issues which some people might find morally very difficult that's part of the territory for the next few months that we're going to be in i think the key principle weirdly i think the government i think has suffered and i think vince is right i think strategically we were very slow at the start of this and i think there will be lots of issues that will be looked at in the long run about about that but there could be an advantage to being a late mover out of lockdown. In the short term, it's very difficult. It's very difficult when you switch on your TV and you see countries like Austria and Germany mm. and South Korea and Taiwan starting to you know, tiptoe back into normal life. People are saying, well, wait a minute, why, why not here? And that's very difficult to manage. But there may be last mover or late mover advantages to watching other countries mm sort of thawing things, getting it wrong, going backwards a bit. The last thing you want is to have this sort of sort of staccato exit from lockdown where you, you release and then you have to go back into the deep freeze and then you release again. That's what you, you, you want to be tentative. And I think you can bring people with you economically and in public health terms, even if you are late at this. I think you can bring people with you if there's a gradualism about that. I think that's a very important principle for them to adopt. Yes, and there certainly seems to be, um, so far, uh, public tolerance of this. But going back to um, sort of on the, on, the, on the purely economic side of things, and if I could go back to Lord Lamont, um, the government has vowed to do whatever it takes to protect uh, the UK from the impact, the economy, and also the, the health impact. But some of our listeners will be wondering where this money could possibly be coming from. I know we touched on this earlier. What sort of fiscal measures are the public likely to face in order to pay for this cushioning now? Well, I think when we emerge from this, we will find ourselves with a very uh, high level of debt. There have been estimates I've seen thrown around suggesting that the average debt to GDP ratio in the developed world may be something like 150, 160 percent of GDP. That means some countries will be well above that and some countries slightly below. You know, that would be an extraordinary change in, in the world. Um, we might have a deficit of something like 15 percent of GDP, an annual deficit. I think as we recover, and the word recover should be inverted commas, the government should be very careful to nurture that uh, uh, gradual improvement in the situation and shouldn't do anything in terms of reducing the debt that would uh, hold back the recovery. That is to say, I think any measures, if they are required to deal with the level of indebtedness, and I'm aware there are many arguments about the cost of servicing the debt, which we can go into, but anything that the government have in mind, if they think the level of indebtedness is too high, I think that should be deferred for later. And you've got to let borrowing and indebtedness take the strain. That may be a strange thing for me to say, but I think the situation is so... I mean, it reminds me a little. I, I was confronted in 1993 with a situation where the recovery was just beginning, and I announced a series of tax increases in order to reduce the deficit in borrowing but I said they wouldn't be implemented for one, two, three years so that you could let the recovery take place. Well, on a more elongated timetable, I think something similar will be required when we, could, we come out of uh, this situation. Well, of course, last year, the then Chancellor, Sajid Javid, declared the end of austerity. Um, and if I could come to you, Sir Vince, uh, obviously, he couldn't see, just like the rest of us, what was around the corner. Um, related to what um, Lord Lamont has been saying, 
I know nobody can tell us, but are we looking at at least another 10 years of austerity? Well, I, I, I've always had problems with this word austerity. I, it, it, you know, people used by different people in different contexts and usually means cutting spending. Mm. But I, I totally agree with Lord Lamont's analysis of this. I mean, there is going to be a very big accumulation of public debt. We're going to have to live with it. We're talking 20, 30 year time frame. Um, there's no reason why we should panic about this. After wars, uh, countries like the UK had vastly higher levels of public debt in relation to their economy than they do today. After the Napoleonic Wars, the First War, the Second War, we were up over 200% of GDP. It's now about 80, 80 to 90. Um, no reason to panic about that. It, it, it should, you know, with, with growth, when that comes, you, you gradually work it down. Maybe there will be uh, an element of inflation that will also erode um, debt to some extent. I mean, some of it's index linked, but, but some isn't. Uh, we do have also very, very low interest rates. Uh, it's been achieved um, partly through quantities of easing. Um, so there are a whole lot of reasons why we shouldn't start worrying about um, the overhang of debt coming out of this crisis. Um, and every reason to avoid rushing into an austerity program. Just one final thought. I mean, there, there is one country that's been grappling with this problem for 30 years, which is Japan, since it had a financial crisis in 1990. They enormous levels of public debt. When they tried reducing it, it made the problem worse because the economy slowed down. The, the burden of debt in relation to the economy got worse. And so you've had this abonomics, which is, you know, expand money, fiscal policy as much as you possibly can. And what the Japanese are doing, at the margin anyway, is effectively monetizing their debt. Uh, the, the central bank is simply financing the deficit. It's all done on a very controlled basis with the supervision of the central bank to make sure they don't break their uh, inflation limits. But that's the kind of unorthodox measure that we're gonna, uh, we're going to be faced with. Okay, thank you, Sir Vince. Um, and to you, Lord Wood, um, you talked about um, President Clinton. I think it's fair to say uh, that the USA has not taken up its usual role of global leader in this pandemic, uh, whatever anyone thinks of the current um, president. But are we witnessing a shift, nonetheless, away from globalization towards economic self-isolation? In, in, it's been striking, hasn't it, for the most part, responses to coronavirus have been national. So do you think that there is that shift away towards economic self-isolation? Well, I, th I think, I mean, the first thing to say is the international response has been absolutely woeful. And, and as I think Vince said earlier on, um, this is even more of a global crisis than the 2008 crash. Uh, it's, a glo you know, it, it's the quintessential parable about globalization, you know, a disease that knows no borders with similar effects across countries requiring a collective response and the collective response has been absolutely pitiful. Um, and I think everyone bears some responsibility for that. I think the response is, I mean, we've got sort of 200 national stories of responding to the, to the crisis rather than anything coordinated. And by the way, even the EU has not had its finest hour, I think, in this respect, in the Eurozone. But, but I'm not sure that that will necessarily usher in an age of 200 separate economic policies and, and the end of globalization. I think in some respects, there will be a, a change of tack. In, in particular, I suspect in, in, in sort of key industries, in particular food and uh, maybe security related industries, there will probably be more of a turn back to national sourcing and national protection. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think there's gonna be a turn away from globalization. I mean, to take one example, it, there is a nightmare brewing in the developing world with, with coronavirus uh, and the effects on that have only just started to flicker on the horizon. Um, and, you know, experts across the piece from NGOs to economic bodies to IMF predict that the, the, the effects could be incredibly savage there. Um, and that's going to usher in the, the spectre of having to get debt forgiveness for countries in Africa and elsewhere. And cooperation with China through multilateral institutions is going to be really important to, to try and tackle that problem. So there is no escape from the need for multilateral cooperation, even though it's very much out, out of fashion at the moment. And the other thing is that every country is going to do a version of what Vince very eloquently set out there as how to respond to this. You know, I think the, the, the analogy I look to is the end of the Second World War and how the United States responded at the end of the Second World War, um, essentially through inflation, printing money, um, and you know, taxing uh, wealthy people a little bit more. I think we're gonna have an exaggerated version of that. I think there's gonna be a big debate across countries about how to increase uh, 
uh, taxes. Uh, maybe unwelcome for any uh, conservative government to face that, but there's going to be the shape of raising taxes is going to be an important issue. Personally, I'd be in favour of some kind of solidarity tax of the sort the Germans put in place after the Berlin Wall. But I mean, there's all sorts of issues that are, are raised about that. But this question of, fin of, of monetizing the debt, of central banks essentially financing government debt, I suspect lots of governments are going to be going down that route. And that raises the question of whether there needs to be international cooperation and a rethinking of the role of IMF and maybe other economic institutions to have a globally coordinated uh, recovery strategy. Uh, it seems like a long way away at the moment, given the attitude of the Trump White House towards any kind of international regime. But I think that will be desperately needed. Could I just, could I just comment on a couple? Please. Um, I mean, I hope Stuart is right that there will be a great reversal of globalization, but I'm not entirely confident of that. I think people will be worried about the security of international uh, supply chains. Also, I think it's important to have the correct reaction to China. Now, I don't wish to be a spokesperson for China, and I totally agree that China has a lot of questions to answer. China uh, misled the world with its statistics. It concealed what was happening. I think China is rightly the object of criticism. But I do notice, both in this country and in the United States, people are trying to react as though China had done this deliberately, whereas it was more incompetence than a mistake. And it's not an argument for solidifying some geopolitical enmity and rivalry with China. We have a rivalry with China, of course, but I think even with a regime that we don't like, it's important when you have areas of common interest to cooperate and to try to keep them within the international system. And I am worried about the way opinion is developing towards, towards China. So, uh, if possible, we must be very careful about retreating from globalization. The same thing, it's just, just on monetizing debt, I agree, this is uh, what is going to happen. I don't, you, you, we've been saying for a long time there's no risk of inflation, and I don't think there is a risk of inflation in the short term. The short term risk is of deflation, but we could easily then move into a situation where we have too much demand and not enough production, you could actually find in a second phase that you do move towards inflation. So although I'm not against what the central banks have been doing, I think one has to watch it very, very carefully. I noticed the other day that uh, Governor Bailey just said, well, um, all we're doing is creating orderly markets. We're not actually monetizing the debt. Well, I think and he was saying the institutional structure will prevent that and prevent inflation taking off. Well, you know, I think those are fine words. Whether they're reality, we will see. Thank you. Well, to all of you, I'd like to ask um, about, you know, on the international focus, um, looking at the EU, it now seems like Brexit was a bit of a walk in the park, but would a no-deal Brexit now add to the economic damage, or will it pale in comparison to the current situation we're in? Uh, to uh, Sir Vince, please, first. Well, it certainly would. <coughs> um, I mean, <I've, coughs> sorry, I think the last thing we want here <coughs> is just reopening the whole Brexit. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm one of the usual suspects on one side, and Lord the Bonds <laughs> on the other side. And, you know, whatever we say is heavily discounted. I, I do worry that the government is pushing its luck a little bit. I think they're rather assuming that the Europeans will simply fold over and reach some kind of agreement. Um, but within the next couple of months, there has to be a, a very clear way forward. I think it would be, you know, really rather reckless to rush into major, what will potentially be quite major structural changes superimposed on everything else. Um, I, I can see that uh, from the government's point of view, they've got to find some sort of face-saving way of acknowledging that at the end of the year, the existing arrangements will run on for a, a year or two, um, and somebody's got to help them do it. Uh, but I, it really would be extremely reckless if um, you know, a hard line was being promoted on this in the middle of all the other chaos. What do you say to that, Lord Lamont? Well, I draw a distinction between the end date for implementation and the end date for negotiation. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't manage to 
reach a free trade agreement by December the 31st. And I think the government are the best judge of whether they themselves have enough time to negotiate. I'm talking about negotiating the arrangements by December the, the 31st. When it comes to the implementation, you, you could extend the implementation period while keeping the December 31st deadline for uh, the negotiation. And you could, you know, all trade agreements virtually have an implementation period in them. You could say in the free trade agreement, all right, things will remain the same. We've agreed what they will be altered to, but they will be altered in a year's time. Thank you. Uh, Lord, Lord Wood, has this current situation given any different colour to your opinion on Brexit? Um, no, I mean, I agree with, I mean, again, I'm a slightly lower profile than usual suspect, but I, I'm one on, on Vince's side on this one. I, 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 I get the sense that the government is thinking, firstly, that, that, that there is a sort of negotiating advantage in hanging tough. You know, the, the, the Michel Barnier complaining a few days ago that, that meetings with the government are a bit of a waste of time, that they're not really getting anywhere. I think that's probably a deliberate strategy to hang tough because they think probably there'll be a desperation to get a deal and that might play to the UK government's advantage. Um, but I mean, look, it, the, the idea of compounding the, 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 in the sort of unfathomable challenges of, of, of coping with COVID and the, you know, the complete desolation of some sectors, that's going to uh, result in with the transition and Brexit at the end of this year, I think is, is, is really reckless. There's no other word for it. I mean, there, there should be ways of, um, staging this um, and I, I think by, by the end of June we formally we will have to request an extension and it's not quite clear how that's going to apply given that we're not in a normal situation here um, so I suspect there will be a delay I think the really interesting politically the really interesting moment would be if the European Union suggests that the delay is needed because there's no way that anything can be achieved in time will the UK government say actually no we want to we want to crack ahead and get this done ASAP. I, I think that will be a, a more difficult thing for them to, to suggest. So, um, but no, I think I think I think the recklessness of, of combining the huge trauma of, of Brexit, which already would have existed, yeah. with the unanticipated trauma of COVID, would be extraordinary weight to put on the UK economy. Thank you, um, so Vince. I know you wanted to come back in there. Forgive me, please, to carry on. No, it's okay. I, I think we've exhausted Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> More than once. Yes, indeed. OK, well, look, um, on this coronavirus series, we are closing each episode by asking all of our guests, with the extra time we all have on our hands now working from home, could you provide us with one recommendation for a book, film or TV show we should indulge in or be educated by in the coming weeks? Can I start off with uh, Sir Vince? Yes, I'm, I'm reading Le Carre's um, Agent Running in the Field. I mean, I was a great fan of Le Carre. His recent stuff has been a little bit preachy, but this is just an absolutely wonderful depiction of British government, the security services in a kind of Brexit era, as it happens. And it's full of wit and irony, a, a lovely, lovely book. And if I could just mention another thing, I'm... My son, as it happens, is a quantum physicist in California. So I've been watching this Dev program, or Dev's program on BBC Two, which is strange. Um, but, you know, I, I, I can engage with it. This, this is the kind of conversation we, we have around the dinner table, and I, yeah. I'm completely absorbed in it. Good recommendation. Thank you. Lord Lamont? Uh, well, like Vince, I've got two. I've been reading... Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light, the third book in the trilogy. I'm about halfway through. It's terrific. I'm reading it very slowly. But I've also discovered on Netflix a wonderful series called Foda. Foda, I think, is an Arab word, Arabic word meaning chaos. And it's an Israeli series. It goes on forever, um, which is about a secret service Israeli team operating on the West Bank of uh, uh, Palestine. And it's very even-handed between an Israeli point of view and a Palestinian point of view, and very interesting. I mean, it's it's a, it's a thriller, but it's it, it shows the relationship between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government, between Hamas and the Israelis, mm. Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, and the day-to-day -day social relationship of Arabs and Israelis. I find it absolutely riveting. Mm. A good insight into sort of living under a, a paranoid world. 
Yes. <laughs> okay. And what about you, Lord Wood? Okay, well, I'm going to have to have two now quickly. Um, what, one is a, a book uh, which is actually similar to the Le Carre book Vince mentioned, which is by my friend Ben McIntyre, who wrote a book called The Spy and the Traitor about uh, Oleg Gordievsky, the, the most important yeah. double agent in the Cold War. It's a wonderful book. You read it thinking this cannot be true, and it is true, and it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary tale. You'll whip through it in about two days if you, if you can get the time. Uh, but the thing I'm doing, which is... Uh, uh, I'm actually watching, and bear with me on this, I'm watching every film ever made by Fritz Lang, who's one of my favorite directors. And Fritz Lang, the German director who left at the beginning of the Nazi period, went to Hollywood. He invented the whole sort of language of 1920s existential cinema. And then you, are, you could argue he invented film noir in the 30s and 40s as well. He's an incredibly important uh, director. And fortunately, most of his films up till about 1950, you can watch for free on YouTube. So um, I've been wading through those. I've done about 20 so far. I'll do a little review on each of them on Twitter. So it's, it's a nice project to trace someone through their career. Um, and these movies are absolutely wonderful. Metropolis in particular, I would recommend if no one's ever seen Metropolis. It's an extraordinary film. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much to all of you. That's been uh, really helpful. And uh, I particularly enjoyed your uh, suggestions for viewing material. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.